Hey, this is Chris Monk at Highline Guitars, and you're watching episode 48 of From the Luthier's Workbench. In this episode, I'm going to be continuing on with part three of my series on um, how I design a guitar and prepare the files for CNC work. And in this episode, what I'm going to do is explain the CAD CAM process. Uh, CAD is CAD, which stands for Computer Aided Design. And that's where you use the computer to design the parts that you're going to actually be making with the CNC machine. CAM stands for, that's C-A-M, and that stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. And that's where you assign tool paths to um, tell the, the CNC machine how to machine those parts that you're going to make for the guitar. So I've got the computer all warmed up, so uh, let's uh, fire up some software and get started. The first step in my CAD CAM process is I need to create a two-dimensional, full-size, full-scale drawing. And I did this using the vector-based drawing program, Adobe Illustrator. The reason why I use Adobe Illustrator is because I've been using it for a lot of years and I'm comfortable with how the program works. Plus, it's plenty accurate for doing the type of work that I need uh, with CAD CAM. So what I've done here is I've created the drawing of the neck and you can see it uh, primarily consists of the outer shape of the neck, which includes uh, the uh, contour area, the neck heel, and the headstock. And then if you look closely, you'll see this curved shape, this arch. There's one just behind the headstock, and then another at the other end, right uh, at the front of the heel. And what that is, is that is the contour shape. It's the profile of the contour of the guitar neck. So uh, once I've created this file, I'll save it to my computer and then I'll import the drawing into the next program in my software chain or my software workflow, which is uh, Rhinoceros 3D. With my Illustrator drawing imported into Rhinoceros 3D, I can begin to manipulate the lines to create what is essentially going to be a frame, a frame that will support the surface of the guitar neck. Think of it as a race car. You build a chassis and a roll cage and then suspend the body from the chassis and roll cage when it's completed. This is sort of the same thing. I'm creating a frame. As you can see, I'm rotating lifting, angling, and repositioning the elements to create the frame. But I don't have all the elements that I'm going to need. Others will have to be drawn in Rhinoceros 3D to complete the framework. In order to create the graceful curve of the volute, I need to manipulate the lines by moving the control points. In order to create a transition between the volute and the neck's back contour, I have to link the two by creating additional framework. And to do that, what I have to do is break the lines that form the contour arch as well as the curved volute into segments. And then I'll connect those segments together with curved lines. Those will then be filled with a surface. Working with curved lines in a 3D space can be a bit tricky. I'll draw the line when I'm in the perspective view, but then I'll edit the line by looking at it from the right side and then from the top to make sure that it's positioned correctly. I have to do this with each segment that I've created, and it may seem like it's time consuming, but it, it really is and it moves pretty fast. As I draw these curved lines, you can start to see how this framework is defining that transition area between the volute and the contour of the neck. Now 
At this point, I have built the framework for half of the transition area contour. So what I can begin to do at this point is select the elements and then fill those areas with uh, surface. And then you can start to see how that transition is taking shape. And it makes even more sense when I fill in the back of the volute. You can really start to see the, how the neck, uh, the back of the neck is taking shape. And now I'll just repeat that process on the other side to finish that transition area. Once I have that transition area complete, I can finish off the headstock. You'll notice, however, that I'm not going to be putting in the tuner holes. And the reason for that is because the neck is an angled headstock. And to do uh, tuner holes in an angled headstock with CNC, I would need to have a four-axis CNC machine, which I don't have. And in fact, most people don't. So I just create the shape just as sort of a reference. Now I'm going to use the arch uh, at the end of that volute transition area, and I'm going to work with the arch that's in front of the heel and connect the two with a surface. The neck heel is constructed the same way that I did the headstock and the volute transition. I'll raise the uh, heel element into position and then I will connect the heel curve with the contour arch. And I'll do that by breaking up those lines into segments and then I'll connect them using curved line sections. While I build out the uh, framework for the heel, uh, there's a few things I should mention about rhinoceros. First of all, I use a two-button mouse on my computer. And you really have got to use a two-button mouse when working in 3D programs like rhinoceros. The reason is, is uh, the two buttons have different functions when it comes to creating and accepting the work that you do. Also, the two-button mouse makes it very easy to navigate around a 3D uh, workspace. You can use the different buttons for panning and zooming and that sort of thing. Um, I, another thing that I really like about Rhinoceros 3D is how easy it is to find the commands and tools that I need to, to do the work that I'm, I'm doing. One of the problems that a lot of 3D programs have is they have this 
incredibly steep learning curve because it's not always easy to find um, the tools and the commands that you need to create uh, the work that you're doing. And uh, a lot of times they're based on um, physics and geometry terms. So it can be a, a real challenge to, to figure out exactly what tool you need for what task. But with Rhinoceros 3D, if you need to do something like, you know, maybe merge shapes together or edit lines or um, drill holes, that sort of thing, but you're not sure what the actual command is, all you have to do is go up to the upper left corner and you'll see there's a dialog box there that says command in it. Just start to type in what you think that tool might be called and anything related to those words will appear in a drop down menu. And because of having the ability to do un, uh, multiple undos, you can try different commands until you find the one that is accomplishing what you need. And uh, for further assistance, down in the lower right corner is another help menu. And every time I make a selection, uh, it uh, tells me all the different things that I can do with that selection. And it's a great uh, source for information on how to use the different tools and commands. But ultimately, if you run into a, a roadblock and can't, can't seem to accomplish what it is you're trying to do, you can go out to your browser and just Google what it is you're trying to do in Rhinoceros. And um, there are plenty of forums out there that will... Uh, likely have an answer for you. And also, uh, Robert McNeil and associates who make Rhinoceros 3D have an excellent uh, help um, documentation for the program, so you can pretty easily find just about anything you want uh, in terms of the tools and the commands. And uh, not only that, but they give you multiple different um, techniques for doing the same thing. So it's just, for me, it's a really easy program to use. And, and I've been very delighted uh, to work with this program. It's so fast and efficient. It works the way I like to work. After finishing the uh, framework for the heel, I just start to fill in the, the different segments with surface the same way I did um, the uh, volute transition and the headstock and as you can see it's starting to uh, take shape and, and make sense. It took about 31 minutes to make this neck in, th in real time. And now that it's finished, I'll export out a version as a stereolithography file, or STL, and I'll use that for the next step in the CNC process. Now before I jump into the next step in the process, I should explain that on the other side of the neck is going to be a truss rod. And I built the slot for that truss rod uh, in Rhino using the same techniques that I used to make the neck. Once I've saved out the STL file, I'm ready to start the uh, CAM side of the design process. CAM, as I said before, stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. And during this process, I'll be assigning tool paths. To do that, I'll be using uh, the software program MeshCAM. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open my NEC STL file, and it will come up looking something like this. And what we have here is we're looking down at the neck, the back of the neck, and you can see the headstock down here, the heel up here. And I've already uh, set up this file in MeshCam, but what you see here is this white box going all the way around, and what that is is the uh, outer perimeter dimensions of the stock that I'm going to be cutting the neck out of. And then uh, the red bars up here are tabs which support this end of the um, the neck while it's being machined out because if you didn't have tabs there's always a chance that that part will fly loose once the router cuts through and then it could get damaged or it can become a, a lethal airborne missile. So uh, I put those tabs in there to keep it positioned. Now if you look at this from the side 
you can see the uh, thickness dimensions of the stock. And you'll notice the headstock actually extends out past the, th uh, the, the dimensions of that stock. And the reason for that is I prefer to make an angled headstock using uh, the tried and true old fashioned method of uh, making a, a scarf joint. So I do that by hand. The reason I like a scarf joint is if I were to, to machine this entire neck out of a solid piece of wood, I would have to use a, a blank that's about two inches thick, which I can source. But the problem is once you've machined all that out, uh, you would notice that the grain runs straight across that angled headstock. And that's what is known as short-grained wood. The problem with short-grained wood is if you were to bump this headstock against a stationary object while the guitar is under string tension, that headstock could snap. It's, it's, your short-graining is weak. Uh, ideally, you want that grain to run uh, straight along the entire length of the angle and to do that the best way is to is to make a scarf joint so I make the scarf joint and then in the end I'll just cut out the shape of the headstock using my bandsaw and I'll also drill the tuner holes this is a part of the process where you have to think through uh, the whole CNC and uh, cutting process and and hand building process and decide which parts should be done with CNC and which parts should be done by hand because some things are actually done faster and more efficiently by hand than they are with CNC. And it, it kind of takes some experience to figure out uh, which of those tasks is best done by hand and which is best done by CNC. But in the end, um, you end up with a uh, the ability to make a part quickly and efficiently by combining the two different methods. So... Uh, my blank is going to have a scarf joint with the angle already formed into it. And then all I'm going to worry about machining with CNC is the heel, the back contour of the neck, and just the start of this volute. So what I have to do is I have to uh, select an area where the, the machine, the CNC machine, is going to actually know to carve and exclude other areas. And the way I do that is I'll select a region to machine. Now, I could also uh, select a keep out region, which would tell a machine that's, you know, you're not supposed to go there. But uh, uh, for this purpose, it's easier just to select the area to machine. And I'll just drag a box that encompasses most of the neck, excluding the headstock. And that's what I'll, that's where the uh, machine will know, or the software will know where to put the uh, tool paths. So then the next thing I need to do is I, I have to establish program zero. And what program zero is, that is where the router is going to start. Before you do any cutting, you have to, uh, after you've clamped down your material to the waste board on the CNC machine, you have to move the router so that the tip of the bit is touching the work surface, uh, the, the um, uh, stock surface at a position known as the zero uh, program zero so that it knows that's where it has to start and where all the carving will be in relation to that. I typically use either the uh, lower left corner or the upper right corner and in this example uh, for clearance reasons on my CNC machine I'll select that um, upper left corner and if I zoom in here you can see there is a red line and a green line and that's the red line is the x-axis and the y is the, or the green is the y-axis. Uh, there's a blue line here too, which you can't really see very well. It's kind of hard to um, show that, but that's actually coming up off of the stock, and that's the z-axis. So the, this is the home position, and that's where the bit will be placed. And once that's placed, um, I can hit send, and the g-code will feed into the machine and it, the router will know uh, where to move to, to carve accurately. So, uh, but before we can do that, we need to set up the tool paths. And with MeshCam, it does it all for you. And what I'm going to do is I'll perform two kinds of cutting passes. The first is a rough pass, and that really just hogs out the wood and gets it down to the basic shape. Then there's a finishing pass, which will go back and clean up that rough carving 
to get it as smooth as possible. And you can actually machine it pretty smooth, uh, almost to the point where all you have to do is some very light sanding in the end. But again, you know, it, it all comes down to deciding how much work you want to do on CNC and then how much you want to do post CNC and figuring out how uh, to maximize uh, efficiency for time uh, purposes. In this case, I could I could actually do a finishing pass, like I said, that would get incredibly smooth, but that could take a long time to do that. So instead, I'm going to do a fairly coarse rough pass here, and, and I uh, determine that uh, coarseness by the numbers that I put in for the depth per pass, the step over, uh, feed rate, plunge rate, and how much stock to leave. And then uh, and the finishing pass, I can determine the step over and then feed rate um, and then f pick the direction that I want the router to move. All these things are, are, are details that uh, takes experience to figure out exactly how you need to set it up for a particular project. But then what I'll do is I'll go ahead, once I'm happy with those numbers, I'll go ahead and hit OK. All this green, when you zoom in, are lines which um, indicate the direction that the router is going to be moving while it's carving. The red lines are what are known as rapid moves. And a rapid move is when the router finishes carving and has to move quickly to another part of the, the project to continue uh, making additional cuts. And I can look at the, the rough carve, and as you can see, that's what the rough carve will look like. And then I can turn that off and turn on just the parallel, and you can see you've got you know literally thousands of lines running across, and each one of those, like I said, is the movement of the router. What I can also do is hit the estimate machine time, and I can see that to fully carve out the heel contour and then the uh, volute is going to take a total of about 88 minutes. Um, around it up to about 90 minutes, so an hour and a half to cut that. Well, that's pretty pretty quick when you consider how long it takes to cut out a neck on a bandsaw and then carve all the contours with traditional tools like spoke shaves and rasp files. So uh, 88 minutes is pretty fast. So then all I have to do is save this, and I typically save it as a basic G-code, and um, the... Uh, file uh, name will be uh, .nc at the end of it and that is going to be um, I've already saved this out so I'm not going to save another one but I'll save this out and then what I can do at that point is there's actually a couple of things I could do one is I could just run the g-code and carve the neck if I was confident that what I have is is viable if I'm not a hundred percent sure I like to use a program called um, Camotics and Camotics is a free software program that you can download from the internet that's available for Windows and Mac but it lets you actually preview what that is gonna look like so we'll go out and we'll grab the g-code file for that net contour and it will show me first of all all the, those green lines which is the movement of the router and the red lines which is the rapid moves but if I want to, I can switch that off and then look at just the shape that it's going to carve. And I can, I can determine, you know, is it going to be smooth enough? Is the shape correct? Is it uh, beginning and ending where I want it to? Is this going to work? And if, if that's the case, if it's going to work and I'm happy with it, then I can um, uh, send the file, the G-code file, to my CNC machine. This is what a G-code file looks like. It's just a long list of numbers and letters. And what each of these lines represents is uh, the coordinates for the router. So uh, the CNC machine's controller will actually convert all this data into electrical signals. And those signals are sent to the stepper motors, which uh, move the router into the position relative to the coordinates. So um, that's kind of kind of gives you an idea of what a G-code file looks like. So this is the file that we're going to be sending to the CNC machine to cut that neck file.
To send the G-code file to the CNC machine, I need yet another program, which is called Universal G-code Sender. And this is a free program. You can download this for either Windows or Macintosh. Um, but the way it works is after you open the program, uh, you connect your computer to your um, CNC machine. And actually, you do this uh, both uh, physically by using a cable. And in my case, it's a USB cable. And then um, you connect via software. Now, this machine isn't uh, in a the same room that my CNC machine is, so I can't physically connect it. But if it were physically connected, I would just simply click open, and that will connect the computer and Universal G Code Sender to the CNC machine's controller. And now I would have the ability to uh, load the G Code file and then send it to that machine and carve it. So uh, before I could do that, I would have to make sure I have my blank prepared and clamped down to the CNC machine and ready to carve. Then I would come back to the computer and I would load the G-code file into uh, G-code sender. And at this uh, point I'm ready to, to carve. I would have the, the, the correct bit in the router. The router would be positioned at the program zero location on the blank. Everything would be ready to go. All I'd have to do is click the send button and the uh, G code would be sent to the machine and then the router would start to move and start carving the neck. So um, that is the, the basic uh, CAD CAM process that I use for making the neck. Well, that's all the time I have for episode 48. Now, I hope I've explained the process I use for CAD CAM. Um, in the next episode, which is uh, episode 49, I'm going to be covering the fourth and final part in this series where I'll be talking about how I set up the files for making a guitar body. And the process I'll be using to do that is very different than the one I just showed you for making the next. So stay tuned.